Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Common Room Talk. My name is Tony, and I'll be your host. This is a brand new podcast talking about all things Harry Potter. And I'm sure some of you may be wondering, why would I want to listen to this guy talk about Harry Potter? And for that, I don't blame you. Well, as I said, my name is Tony, and I am a huge fan of Harry Potter. I was probably at 12 or 13 when the first Harry Potter movie, Sorcerer's Stone, came out. And I remember going and seeing it and just absolutely falling in love with it. And I, I wish I could remember all of my first original raw emotions about it, but unfortunately, I can't. And I know that I had went back a few times in theaters to see the first one, and it, it was just magical. I remember, I think it was Scholastic and Coca-Cola actually did a commercial where they were doing a sweepstakes called Live the Magic, I believe. I think it was called Live the Magic Sweepstakes, where you had a chance to like earn books and Coca-Cola. And I think the biggest thing was being able to earn a trip. I think it was like 12 people would earn a trip to go see the castle where... Like the whole movie was filmed, even though there were a few different places and locations that they used for the filming, they had one place in particular where you would go and you'd get to see a lot of these things that they used in the movie. And I wish I could remember all the details, but it, I remember seeing this commercial for the first time and it was like people walking through fields and you saw these owls swooping in and they, they had this really like wonderful music and I'm, I want to say it was the Harry Potter theme song I can't remember it again it was so long ago but it was it's one of those like nostalgic things that you sit and you think about and I remember seeing this commercial and just wanting to win the sweepstakes so bad but obviously I was a kid and there, there was nothing I could do to win it and um, my my mom probably didn't even really know what Harry Potter was at the time but I remember that it started this journey in my life that looking back now has been just amazing it is what Harry Potter has meant to me in my life growing up is there there aren't ways of describing it accurately. But I do remember that growing up after watching the first movie, I was for some reason I was really big uh, as a teenager into like hacky sacking and just doing stuff on my own. Um, I, I really think it's because I have just crazy ADHD and I was on all kinds of medicine growing up. And so I would spend a lot of time on my own, particularly at nighttime when I couldn't sleep. And I remember just constantly waiting, as I'm sure thousands of kids all over the world has done, waited for an owl to bring me a letter telling me that I was going to Hogwarts. So by then, I still hadn't even touched the books. It was just simply the movies that I really enjoyed. And I remember when I finally got introduced to the books, I actually, it's really funny, I, I went backwards. And so I remember where I lived, I went to the public library, and I remember seeing the cover for Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And um, unfortunately, I took the book from the library and I, I never gave it back. And I know that's stealing, that's wrong, I was a dumb teenager, and it's not okay, shame on me, shame on teenage Tony, how dare you. Anyways, I started at the fourth book, read it, loved it, read it again, loved it even more, and then actually went backwards. I read book three, and then book two, and then finally book one, and then I remember that was the same year that... The next book came out when Harry Potter Order of the Phoenix came out. I, I jumped into that after reading book one. And so I, I loved I loved the series. And from that point on, I was one of those people who were just eagerly anticipating the release of every book uh, thereafter. And I, I remember very specifically when Deathly Hallows came out, where I'm living now currently in the, the city where I live, at Kroger, the grocery store. They had a book release. They had a sign that it was coming out midnight, the, the night that it was coming out. And I remember driving past Barnes & Noble in one of the main cities around where I live, and there was a line wrapped around the building. And I was just like, man, I am I, – I, I would wait in that line, but I didn't want to. And I remember seeing the sign over at Kroger that they were – selling the book there at midnight. And so it, I went in right at midnight, was able to go in. Actually, it was before midnight. They, they weren't actually supposed to start releasing the book yet. But I remember it was probably like 1130. And I picked up a copy of the book and I bought it. And there was no line. There was nobody there. I was the only person who showed up to buy this book when I did. 
so yeah, that was really the first time that I went through the series. And now where I am, I actually have a goal. I want to be able to say that I have been through the Harry Potter books at least 100 times. My goal is 100 times, and I am at 74 right now. I started tallying years ago, and I know it might seem like that is a bit ridiculous, maybe ambitious, but I have a job that allows me to listen to the audiobooks, which is by far my favorite way to go through them. And I go through them multiple times a year as I have this job where I'm driving and I just I have so much time that it's actually very easy to go through them. So yeah, I'm on my 74th time. I'm thinking that as I go through this podcast and go through the books, I'm sure I'm going to listen to them multiple times. But I would really like like to have this as the 75th time that I go through it, uh, going through it with you guys in this series. And so some people might ask then, why am I so I don't want to say obsessed. My wife would say obsessed with Harry Potter. It, Harry Potter has been something that has got me through so much in life, uh, whether it was through being bullied in high school or just depressions or dealing with breakups. Any time that I have had a hard time in life, I've gone to Harry Potter. And even in the happy times of my life, I've also gone to Harry Potter. It's a, It was a way of escaping from the world. And I'm sure... There are tons and tons of people in the world who can say the exact same thing, that they've gone to Harry Potter as a means of escape from whatever reality that they were in. And just as so many other people probably have, there have been so many times where I have put my eyes to the pages and everything around me disappears. And it's just so releasing and even I want to say safe it's a safe place to be and it was for me growing up and so that has been something that has just been so dear to me that that I can't imagine my life without Harry Potter in it and I I talk about it all the time Uh, whenever I'm watching the movies with friends they're constantly asking me like why is this person doing this or why is this like that and I'm just like actually this wasn't even in the the book so I have no idea what's going on or vice versa just like talking about little details that that aren't in the books or, or sorry aren't in the movies but are in the books and I just love talking about it I love talking about Harry Potter I love talking about the characters and the places and the things and it's there's nothing that is not amazing about Harry Potter to me. And so that's actually one of two of the big reasons why I wanted to start this podcast. One, for my wife's sanity, as I'm sure it probably drives her crazy how much I talk about it. And she has become quite knowledgeable because of how much I talk about it. But so I have an outlet to talk about Harry Potter, talk about the things that I love and the things that I don't love, because there are a few things that I dislike about uh, some of the way things are handled, mostly in, in the movies, but there there are a few things that I look at, and I, I wouldn't even say dislike. I shouldn't have said dislike, but I would say that sometimes don't make sense to me as I'm just like, why is this like this if this person knows so much about this? And there, there's going to be plenty of examples coming up as we go through, even probably in the first chapter even. And so... Yeah, I I love talking about it, and it's one of the bigger reasons why. The other reason is this, is because I want to get better at my public speaking. As I was told that one way at getting better at public speaking is doing a podcast, I kind of just put these two things together and was like, why not make a podcast about Harry Potter? And so being a Christian and in my church, I'm actually a teacher. I I teach some of the Bible studies, and as I'm teaching to some of the men in our church, I, I realize that I still sometimes have a hard time talking in front of them. And so This is a way that hopefully will also help me become a better speaker so I can do these things that I'm hoping to do with my future. And with that being said, please extend me grace as, again, I'm not that great at speaking. Uh, I'm not very articulate. I will stumble over my words. I sometimes mumble. I sometimes will probably pull away from the mic or 
probably lean too close to it. And, and this is all new for me and I'm learning and, and I absolutely love that I get to do this with whoever is going to be listening to this. And, and I apologize in advance as I am still learning all of these things. It is going to be a ride and it's going to be fun, I hope. I'm going to make it as fun as possible. And so with that, let's actually get into our first book. We're going to be going over Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or if for some crazy, I wouldn't say crazy reason, but if by some crazy chance that this reaches people in the UK or just people who are fans of the UK version, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Actually, I lied. Something I want to say first about just the, the podcast is what I'm kind of hoping for. I don't want to say expect because I, I, I honestly don't know what this is going to be. Uh, in three or four episodes, things can change. And as I said, I'm learning. But what I'm hoping for is just uh, being able to go through and talk about the books and the chapters, uh, I want to be able to compare them to the movies and see like what some of the differences are, um, pick up on maybe things that I missed through you guys because I want to be able to have interaction with people who are listening, uh, things that I missed because I am, again, by no means an expert whatsoever. I just happen to have a lot of information in my head that I do want to talk about. And so yeah, I'm hoping to go through chapter by chapter. And I, I just want that to be the substance. I want to talk about a lot of things. I want to talk about the characters, uh, people that we, we love, such as like Harry, Ron, and Hermione. I, I want to talk about people that we might not like, uh, such as Snape, which I actually really like. Snape, I know a lot of people don't because they think he was a bully, and he might have been a bully. Um, but I do want to talk about him. I want to talk about people that we don't like, such as Umbridge and obviously Voldemort. Um, these are all characters that even though we don't like them, we still like them because they are an essential part of the story and, and is what makes it what it is. And so I, I want to talk about these things. I want to talk about creatures. I want to talk about the things that Hagrid brings in, stuff that Harry encounters um, out in the wizarding world. I want to talk about some of the artifacts. And, and as I said, I, I also... As we're going through this and we come across certain things, I want to talk about just the things in the real world that that might have actually inspired J.K. Rowling to go through and, and, and put these into her story. And one of the things that I love hearing are the things that inspired her. And obviously, a lot of it is from the internet. Um, some of it is from interviews with her. But um, you can't always believe everything that you're going to hear. And, and I say this, too, is if I say something that's incorrect, please do not hesitate in correcting me. Um, I uh, try and take humility as often as I possibly can. And I know that I'm not right about everything. Uh, but the way of becoming more right is being corrected and I am willing to be corrected. And so yeah, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about spells and wands, wand lore. I, I want to talk about every single aspect that we can as we come across it. I, I, I want to unpack everything and I'm sorry if I keep coming up with repeated words inside of here. I know as I keep saying I want to talk about this, I want to talk about that. I keep saying talk, and it's something that I'm trying to avoid, trying to repeat, trying to avoid repeating words. I'm trying to avoid us and ums, and so that's hopefully something that's going to get better as we go through more and more episodes. And so, yeah, now we can get into um, the first book, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which, was, which is what I'm going to refer to it as. Uh, obviously the UK version is the Philosopher's Stone and I don't want to go into a whole lot of like fun facts just to uh, open up the book. Uh, if I remember things as they come, I'll say them out. Um, but I don't want to just dive right into that. But a few things that I do want to say, obviously the first one here is was published in the UK first in 1997. And I believe that the US version by Scalactic was in 1998. They were almost, almost a year apart, just less than a year by a few months. And in the UK, you had the Philosopher's Stone. And here in the US, we have the Sorcerer's Stone. And from listening to the audiobook, A History of Magic, which I believe that's just an audiobook. I could be wrong, um, but I thought I saw somewhere in there that it said, or I heard in there, that it said it was just going to be an audiobook, which I believe is an audiobook, not so much a tour of a museum over in the UK, um, but they have a lot of stuff in there that is from that museum that they talk about, and there are a lot of things that inspire J.K. Rowling, but I know that one of the things that, one of the reasons that they changed it, which I heard about inside of this uh, audiobook was when they brought over Harry Potter in the Philosopher's Stone to the U.S. 
one of the producers or one of the publishers, I can't remember exactly who, did some kind of test surveys asking people what their thoughts were. And they thought that Philosopher's Stone, Philosopher Stone would have sounded a little too philosophical and, and wouldn't have really just grabbed the attention. And so they actually had a few names. I think one of them was Harry Potter and the School of Magic. And I can imagine... Uh, that title, I don't know. To me, it's not as catchy as Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And so, yeah, the the book that I'm using, I, I actually am going to go through the, the illustrated editions as well as talk probably pretty heavily about the audiobooks, because the audiobooks are how I go through them the most. But the illustrated editions, one, if you don't have the illustrated edition, go get it. It's so worth it. The, the artwork in here by Jim K is absolutely gorgeous. It is some of the most mind-blowing art you, you could ever see, and every single bit of it is all about Harry Potter. And I'm assuming, and I shouldn't assume, but I'm guessing that if you're listening to this, hopefully you are a fan somewhat of Harry Potter. Or if if not, if you're one of my friends who just wants to uh, have a jab at me and you're going to listen to it and then critique the poop out of me, um, you're probably just laughing to have, or just listening to have a laugh at me, which is equally okay. Go get this book and, and look at it. Uh, if not, I will give you, well, no, I won't give you my copy. Um, just go get your own. But I highly recommend going and getting this book. The artwork is is amazing, and when you look at the the opening cover, the the, the details that Jim K puts in here, he actually references a lot of things from his own life, a lot of his own experiences. I know, again, in the history of magic, he does a lot of interviews and he talks about just things that he he loves and how he incorporates them into his artwork. And something that's also really impressive is that he goes out into the public and finds people that he wants to be like the example of the people he's going to to draw or the, or the things that he's going to draw. I know for Diagon Alley, for example, he, he creates created a, a huge model uh, to draw. And the same with the Hogwarts Express, where he, he talked about how he he used army men figures, like little army men toy figures as children, and then used a piece of cardboard uh, to represent adults and use them as a scale to build a full size, uh, to scale full size, a uh, replica of what his incorporation of the Hogwarts Express would be. And then he drew it. And to me, that just like that that passion that he has for for doing these things is amazing. And so, if you don't have the books, I'm sorry, but I'm going to talk about a lot of these drawings. And, and so, uh, spoiler alert: if you don't want to hear these drawings, or also spoiler alert: if you are not familiar with the books and you want to be familiar with them before I talk about them, go read them quickly or go listen to the audio books. Uh, you have Jim Dale for the U.S. And, and Stephen Fry for the U.K. I've never heard the Stephen Fry when I've heard bits and pieces through interviews and stuff. He he sounds great, but I absolutely love Jim Dale. He ha he comes up with voices for every character that is talking in the entire book series, and it's amazing. So on the the cover of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, the illustrated edition, you you have a a drawing of the Hogwarts Express. There's a lot of steam and stuff around, and it's it's so far from what I've seen in a lot of the 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 drawings and representations that he does uh, he includes a hog somewhere uh, and for example this one has like a hog with wings sitting on the front of it there are some animals and people kind of going around you can see some pigeons and some cats there's an owl flying by in front of the the train and you see while the other people are kind of blurred out you see harry standing here pushing his cart and you see hedwig in her cage on this cart and he's just standing there looking in awe of everything that's going on around him. Then inside the cover, when you open up the cover, the first page here is a black and white drawing of just a, a part of Hogwarts where you would find, it looks like the Great Hall, and it is absolutely gorgeous. It's a side profile of it, and you just see all of these windows and the turrets on the roof, and on either end of the Great Hall, you actually see like the, the backside, which I think would face out over the lake, would probably be the part that you would come up to and see first if you're coming across the lake in the boats, and you actually see there's a there's the front half of a hog mounted to the very top of it. Uh, it looks like almost like taxidermy in the back of it is the the butt end oh, the the butt of the hog and, and it's really cool because it's like taxidermied in a way where it's cut in half but it looks as if the entire hog could be going all the way through the entire roof here and then inside you have the little illustrations where it talks about like the opening page again harry potter a sorcerer stone and there's harry looking at it looks like his platform ticket with all of his um stuff standing next to each other like his luggage and everything um then you have the 
table of contents and it has little drawings and everything in here as well. Like all the little details are amazing. And then we come to chapter one, the boy who lived. When we open to this page, it looks like there are just small family portraits. I'm guessing this would be one side of the Dursley wall. And you, you see really good depictions of each of the characters. When I see each of the characters, I mean Petunia, Vernon, and Dudley. Uh, the, those are the only three that are depicted here. I wouldn't actually think that they would have a photo of Harry anywhere. And so as we go into the very first words of this, we see it, it, it's literally the first words are Mr. and Mrs. Dursley. So they're the first characters right out of the bat that that are talked about. Uh, a book about Harry Potter, uh, all the people that we're going to meet and the people that we probably end up hearing I wouldn't say the least about but they get some of the smallest portions as they're usually only brought in into the first and final chapter of the books and yet out of the entire series are the first two that we hear about Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive. The word privet being just a reference to a very common bush that's found in a lot of English gardens uh, called the privet bush and so that's where you get this this reference from. And the name of the area being Little Whinging. I think that's how I've heard it pronounced, Little Whinging. And it's supposed to be very closely related to like the word whining. Uh, they're, they're just talking about and, and trying to represent what we'll see with the Dursleys just being very comfortable in, in their class where they are. Uh, we know that here in just a little bit, it actually says uh, the Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret. But in regards to they had everything that they wanted, they, they were very comfortable. They were very... I would go beyond comfort. They were happy with with where they were. Um, maybe uh, we do see that in the the second book that this might have been just a movie thing. I can't remember. I'll have to go back through the first chapter. But uh, Vernon talking about getting a vacation home after being able to make a really big sale in for his drills, which we'll get into as he, he works at this place called Grunnings, where he sells drills. But we see that they are content where they are uh, there in this suburb, and they are just absolutely full of themselves. They think of themselves as being better than everyone else around them. And, and so that you have these characteristics coming in of being just common and mundane, but they don't think that of that themselves. Also, I want to apologize really quick because our puppy is sleeping in the background and she is having some of the most adorable little puppy dreams. And I thought maybe if it's heard, I would go in and edit it out. But I really want to keep this as candid as possible. I don't want this to be scripted, really. I want it to just flow freely and just be unique in that sense that, one, as I'm trying to get better, and I know that if I'm speaking live or speaking to people, I don't have that opportunity to go back and just edit my speech or edit what's going on around me. So uh, enjoy if you guys hear the little uh, puppy dream barks. But yeah, we, we have number four, Privet Drive, and I know on, on Pottermore that uh, J.K. Rowling talked about just the number four being a, a number that she just never really liked. And so that was for some reason why she she used that number. She just doesn't like, she never liked the number four. It, it was not a good number for some reason. And as I said, we, we see that, that Mr. Dursley, uh, Vernon, is the director of, of a firm called Grunnings. They made drills. We see uh, throughout the other books that he, on top of guests being the director, he still does some kind of sales because he tries to make sales to, to some other people. And we have the, the, the first description of him of being a, a, a big, beefy man with hardly any neck. And I'm sure when we hear things like that, uh, again, one, remember, this is a different generation. And so like, it is just a description of somebody. I don't think this was ever meant to just like be like an insult to anybody, but it is just a literal description of, of this man. And so yeah, he was a big beefy man with hardly any neck. And it says that he has a, a very large mustache. And this is what I really like about JK Rowling in the way that she she describes her characters. It's not super in depth, you don't get like three or four pages like you get with some of the Tolkien descriptions and in, in his books with Lord of the Rings and Hobbit and stuff where you could get descriptions for three or four pages but she gives very simple yet just real descriptions of people and you can just imagine them very easily in your head and then we have the next of Mrs. Dursley and she was thin and blonde which is different from the movie because obviously we have Petunia with with dark hair and 
here she she's depicted with blonde uh, and nearly twice the amount of usual neck so maybe she's making up for for vernon not having any neck at all she has enough neck for for the both of them and we see part of her characteristic as being um just like nosy and spying as she says she uses her neck to crane over the the fences and, and look at people and then we see the dursley's son uh they had dudley in their opinion, as it says, there was no finer boy anywhere. And so they thought very highly of Dudley. And so it says that they they had a secret. They had everything that they wanted, but they also had a secret. And their greatest fear was somebody finding out what it was. And so when we go into this, we, we know it will, it's instant, instantly answered in the, almost answered in the next sentence. They didn't think that they could bear it if anyone found out about the potters. So if you were to stop there, you're just wondering, well, who are the potters? But would obviously give reference to the title of the book, Harry Potter. And so we can start throwing these together. And then it says, Mrs. Potter was Mrs. Dursley's sister. And, and so it, you start seeing this and we see the, the, the break in their relationship as it says that they hadn't met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended that she didn't even have a sister and that she didn't like their good for nothing husband. And they were as un ish as it was possible to be. And then it just continues on saying that the, the Dursleys knew of the Potters having a son, and it says that they, they would shudder to think if the neighborhood found out about the Potters. And so we see right off the bat that the Dursleys don't like something about the Potters, and they don't want people to know about it, and they're they're very self-conscious. They're, they're afraid of what people would think about them if whatever the secret is got out. They don't want anybody to know. But we, we see that they're so self-absorbed. They're, they're just so full of themselves. And I was going to go more into a description of them a little bit later, but I, I think this might be a good time now. And when I say go through this now, it, it's it's tough because I, to, I want to share things as we come through them. I don't want to very regularly reference to the future of the books, even though we're going to go through them and a lot of it does pertain to what we're going to talk about now. I, I really want it to be something that we talk about then and have a way of coming back and talking about things. But one of the things that I do want to point out, as I'm using Pottermore for a lot of references as well, uh, we, we do know that Petunia and Vernon actually met at work Starting with the next day, which here it says it was a Tuesday, there was mysterious and strange things going on all over the country. It says that they, the Dursleys were really unaware of it. And as Mr. Dursley was getting ready to leave for work, he goes to, to kiss Dudley goodbye, but missed. Uh, it said that Dudley was having a little temper tantrum, and Vernon refers to him as the little tyke, uh, like praising him for having this this tantrum. And, and I think this is honestly the first time that you really see what, I, I know I just said that I wasn't going to reference future stuff too often, but I, I think I'm going to probably do it a few times here now. But in, in the Deathly Hallows, you, you see him refer to Dudley being almost abused by the Dursleys, by the way that they have just given him everything that, that he wanted. And this is where you really see the beginning of, of that. I think you, you see the way that they're treating him and looking in on him, even as a kid throwing a temper tantrum, and they're praising him for it. But he, he leaves the house, and as he's leaving, he sees this cat, this uh, this tabby cat sitting on this corner, sitting on the corner of Privet Drive, and it was reading a map and he does this double take looks back and then there's not a map and so he's backing out and he looks back again at the cat and it's reading the sign for privet drive but he's like no not reading cats can't read and it just is a a, a really odd start to the day he continues on his morning. He he sees a bunch of weird people dressed in in weird clothes. We see it's talked about as we know their cloaks, and he's just judging them left and right as he sees them. Gets to work, and it says that he was just in his element. He had yelled at several people, got some things done, and it says that he was in a really good mood. And I think this is where you really start to get a good measure of Vernon Dursley. And again, f referencing the future, something we see Sirius says in the, in the Goblet of Fire, if you want to know what a man is like, take a good look at how he treats his inferiors not his equals. And so we, we probably see a, a, a glimpse here of how, how Vernon is to 
his inferiors. He likes to yell. He likes to be domineering. He likes to be in charge. And I think we can really draw good insight onto what his character is like simply by how he is treating his inferiors here. And going back to the the tabby cat really quick, this is actually the the first glimpse that we have of Professor McGonagall, which hasn't been revealed yet. It's going to be in just a bit, but this is actually the the first time that we are are seeing her. And, and back to Vernon. So come lunchtime, he was in a very good mood. Thought he would go stretch his legs and go across the the street and and buy a bun from the baker to to have for for lunch and so it says that he had completely forgotten about all the weird men in cloaks and starts going on over across the street and he actually passes uh, a group of them again and as he's passing them he hears them here's part of their conversation uh where they mention the word the potters and their son harry and it stops vernon dead in his tracks it says at that moment that he was actually flooded with fear and so we see this uh this frantic kind of uh just well, fear uh come into to vernon over hearing these things and he rushes back into his job uh, into his office and he he's picking up his phone getting ready to call petunia and tell her and he starts to talk himself out of it surely he thinks to himself that that harry really isn't that uncommon of a name or sorry that potter isn't that uncommon of a last name and that there's definitely or there's got to be people with a son named harry and so yeah he decides not to tell her uh thinking that it's not a big enough reason to worry her sister and he he says that he ultimately thinks he didn't blame her if he had a sister like that but then again he thinks about the fact that there are still all of these people in cloaks and then he heard that stuff and you can tell that he's just really on the fence about this about about talking to petunia and so for the rest of his work day he really just struggled to concentrate and he he goes to leave at the end of the day ends up walking into a to a person uh and and knocks him over says sorry and, and the man actually stands up and, and says don't be sorry my dear sir for nothing could upset me today rejoice for you know who has gone at last even muggles like yourself should be celebrating and so now we actually have our first face to face with a, a wizard as we we know this is going to be a wizard as all of this is revealed as to what is going on um but we also have our first mention of you know who and it's it's crazy to think about how in this chapter we're four pages in of the first chapter and we've already come across so many people. Uh, it It's just so well done. And the first time, first few times you go through this, you might not even recognize it. You already have Vernon, you have Petunia, you have Dudley, you have this man that he knocks over and you have Mrs. McGonagall. And you have you know who you like you have so many people already just in the first few pages brought up, and also to point out you you see that whatever has been going on, whatever these mysterious events that have been going on with owls and shooting stars that we're going to see here in just a, a few um, paragraphs, there's definitely something going on, and as we know later in the series about like the statute of secrecy and not being able to just reveal the wizarding world uh people really had their their guards down they were just elated and you see him talk to a muggle and, and call vernon a muggle to his face and this is also one of the things that i think would have been weird to think about is when we see coming up that that vernon is actually very aware of what witches and wizards were to what extent i don't know but enough to know that he didn't like them or he already had a prejudice built up towards them. Yet here, he doesn't recognize being called a muggle or recognize what is going on around him with the people in cloaks. However, Vernon continues on home, and and this is one of the things I think that you really also get a good view of his character. And it says that he has been hoping that he really was just imagining things but he says here, or it says here that he hoped, well, I'm just going to read it, which he had never hoped before because he didn't approve of imagination. 
And it's just, what has this man been through to just make him such a closed-minded person? In all honesty, when when you think about later on in the books, uh, well, the last one in the Deathly Hallows, when you have Harry, Ron, and Hermione sitting in front of Xenophilius Lovegood, and he looks at Hermione and, and says that she was very closed-minded. I, I feel like the way that Luna and her dad look at Hermione not as being unintelligent, but as being closed-minded. Almost, I, I see a better representation of Vernon inside of the way that they look at Hermione than Hermione actually is, if that makes sense at all. And the fact that like he's very closed-minded about any of these things, that he is just so against any and all of just what the wizarding world is. And again, we don't know how much that is. We don't know how much he has been privy to to know how much Petunia has told him, because one of the things that we see, uh, again, from J.K. Rowling on Pottermore is that Petunia did tell Vernon secrets uh, one night sitting in their car. It says that she, she spilled the beans on the entire thing. And so he is aware of it. We just don't know how much. But we see Vernon pull into his driveway, and he looks, and he still sees the cat standing there. And it looks like it hasn't moved. Well, no, it has moved. It is now sitting on the garden wall, so it has moved. Um, but it's still there. He still recognizes the, the cat's still there, and this is on top of everything else. He tries to shoo the cat away, literally by saying, shoo, said Mr. Dursley loudly. And, oh, I mean, it was probably much more stern than that. Shoo was what I said. He was probably like, shoo, get out of here, go, shoo. Uh, and not the pathetic little shoo I, I just did. But it says he said it loudly, uh, and the cat didn't move. And he's probably one of the few people ever to uh, talk to Professor McGonagall like that and really get away with it, if you consider it getting away with it. Because it does say that it just gave him a stern look we then get to see more of Mrs. Dursley and her just personality, the way that she is. It says that she had a nice, normal day, and she was telling Mr. Dursley about it, about the problems that she heard with next-door neighbor's daughter and how Dudley learned a new word, shant, which I, I'm actually I'm kind of confused about this because when you listen to the audiobooks, I'm pretty sure, at least in the Jim Dale version, it says that Dudley learned a new word won't and here it says shan't and, and so i'm going to look it up I, i'm not sure which versions say shan't and which ones say won't but i know that there is some difference in them but it, it is cool to see that the as it alluded to earlier about petunia having twice as long a neck as a normal person using it to crane over people's fences you see this continuation of her uh, i'm assuming probably overhearing about the next door neighbor's problems and, and with their daughter and, and maybe what they're getting into dudley then continues on into the living room to catch the evening report and, and this is i think is really exciting so you you have the the man on the news talking about the bird watchers reporting that the nation's owls are acting really weird they even though they're only out usually to hunt at nighttime and hardly ever seen in the daylight there have been hundreds of sightings of them throughout the entire day uh, since sunrise it says and experts can't explain as to why and then that the newsreader himself says this is what it says the newsreader allowed himself a grin and then continued on saying most mysterious and now over to Jim, which is the weatherman. And he asks Jim a question and Jim responds with this. Well, Ted says the weatherman. I don't know about that, but blah, 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 blah. Talks about the owls and also the, the shooting stars. It wasn't wet like he promised. But the thing that I really wanted to point out was this, that he said – Ted. And I think that this personally, along with the little mischievous grin that he has there, I think that this is actually Ted Tonks. I think this is actually Nymphadora Tonks's father. Now, while I can't just definitively back this up, there are a few things that I would like to try and point out about it. One, J.K. Rowling is really good at bringing future characters into the stories early and I'm not saying that she would have totally had this planned out yet but it's not uncommon for her to do this as we see in just a few pages actually that Hagrid shows up on a motorbike lent to him by Sirius Black we don't see Sirius Black for two more books yet he's already mentioned also JK Rowling in some of her very like early artwork on Hogwarts and the descriptions of it she very clearly 
made it known where she wanted the Whomping Willow out when the first book came out because she knew already what she was going to be doing in the future with it and that it was going to have a huge part in in some of the stories being told. And then also what I want to point out is that even though Ted was a wizard, we do know that there were wizards working in muggle positions for work sometimes. We, we saw it with well, kind of a hint of it in a little bit of the backstory for Snape in the Deathly Hallows when they were talking about Petunia's letter as a child and how there might have been muggles working undercover in the post office. And really, when you think about it, It doesn't seem like the community for the Wizarding World is all that large. It seems like everybody really does know everybody. And really the only substantial jobs that we hear about are Gringotts or in the Ministry of Magic or in Hogwarts. And so like if you're a wizard and those are the three main occupations, it's really not alluded to how much really there is out there. We know that there are other professions like Mad mad zoologists i'm pretty sure i'm butchering that word but uh, there there are other occupations out there and we, we know that they are working and we we know that they exist but I, I can't sit there and assume that every single wizard has a wizarding job because they're also just from what we see even just in hogwarts alone hundreds of students but it still doesn't seem like the wizarding world at least in this area is that expansive again it does seem like a lot of people really seem to know who each other is and regardless i i look at that and i see that there there's probably out of probability a greater probability that there are wizards working inside of muggle just occupations and so it wouldn't be a surprise that ted tonks would be working at a news station as a reporter or news anchor at some sort and so yeah uh, vernon hears all of this on the news the shooting stars he hears about the owls he thinks about all of the mysterious people and cloaks and it says that he sat frozen in his armchair and he's kind of really adding two and two together so he he works up the courage and finally asks petunia and again i think this is where you see that i really think that he is fearful of petunia i think that petunia might actually wear the pants in the family i don't know it might go back and forth and not that it matters i just think it's a cool dynamic to it that he saw this man who could bully people around in the office but comes home and is fearful of his wife and so yeah but you see him work up the courage to to talk to her about it asking her you haven't heard from your sister lately have you she replies no why and he just says funny stuff on the news owls shooting stars and that there were a lot of funny looking people today she replied so what and he said well i just thought maybe it was something to do with you know her a lot and so we also again see a recognition uh that he knows something about her side of the family vernon then kind of just deciding whether or not he should mention potter uh changes tack and just asks about their son is be about Dudley's age now wouldn't he he said and she replies I suppose so and then Vernon asks about the name Howard isn't it and she says Harry nasty common name and you ask me and something I want to point out here is and this is not me saying that Petunia is on the same level of being evil or anything as Tom Riddle but we kind of see almost a very similar uh, just I want to say reaction to what is considered common we see tom riddle actually respond in the same way about his name and he says a lot of people have that name they they, they both have this disgust for uh, having something common and i don't know it was just something that when i was going through it this time and, and I, I hear petunia say nasty common name if you ask me i can almost hear tom riddle saying the exact same thing and so the the last part that we're going to touch on tonight is this they they go to bed and Vernon's trying to put it out of his mind. The cat's still there, and he's just beginning to wonder if he was really imagining things. Could this have to do with the Potters? And if it did, if it got out that they were related to the pair of, well, he didn't think that he could bear it. And so Dursleys go to bed. Um, Mrs. Dursley falls asleep quickly, uh, but Mr. Dursley lay awake thinking these things over. 
and as he's thinking to himself, you you see this bit of him thinking the the Potters know very well what he and Petunia thought about them and their kind, and you couldn't see how Petunia and he could get mixed up in all of that. And so you see him yawn, go over, like roll over, get ready to try and fall asleep. And so yeah, that's where we're really gonna leave it tonight there there's still a lot of this chapter left and i was going to try and do this all in in just one episode here but i think we're going to have to break the first chapter up into two parts and i'm really excited because of what we have coming next and i'm sure that if there are people listening to this who have only seen the movies you've probably just listened to that thinking what the heck is going on if you haven't read the book, everything that we kind of just went over is not in the movie because the movie obviously, as we all know, takes place where you see Dumbledore kind of walking into the picture out of the mist. And that's what we're going to dive into next. Because yes, it does happen in the book. Uh, it's just not the first thing that actually happens. And wow, this is this is it. This is the the end of the first episode. And and please, if you like this, if, if it's something that you think you are going to continue listening on, on or if you don't even want to listen on but you just want to support me please give this a a a five-star rating rate it whatever is i honestly best your own opinion i don't want to ask you for five stars if you don't think it's worth five stars uh but if if you do please leave leave a good review let me know what you think Uh, i'm going to have an email set up that you guys can email i haven't got that done just yet so hopefully by next episode and you guys can send me feedback Uh, i'll find a way to get that out there it'll probably be in the next episode but thank you so much for listening to common room talk again my name's tony And I look forward to talking to you guys again soon. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.